if that's okay for you all. Yep. Good. So I'm going to cover the subject that Sarah mentioned, but I'm putting it in a bit of a sandwich. And I want to begin really by paying credit to, to Alan and to Greg and to Barbara for their absolutely amazing effort in putting together the paper that was published last year. Uh, when I downloaded it, I just had a look, there were 8,000 downloads. I see there are now up to 26,000. And that was just a fantastic effort. And if you look at the time that it was taken to review and then represented re and so on, I mean, I just get so excited when research arrives real time when it can really add value. And I just wanted to pay credit to the three of them. And I feel very privileged to be being the, the fourth speaker on a call that's following those three. Uh, I have an extra reason for welcoming their paper in that last October, I started supervising a, a doctoral student who is studying blended learning in China. So um, we've spent an awful lot of time looking at Sangster et al 2020. And what's particularly good about it is that it actually has in it a whole section on um, opportunities for further research. So if you've got any students that are thinking of doing research around the, um, the pandemic and its impact on accountancy education, then um, this paper is a phenomenal way to start. So I just wanted to mention that as an, as an introduction. So what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about four things. I'm going to talk first of all about patterns of learning and the complete professional, which was the original framework that I developed for my own doctoral research. I'm then going to talk about second and last, I'm going to talk about two blogs that I wrote for the ICAW Academia and Education Community, um, one in April and one then last autumn. And then sandwiched between those, I'm going to talk about the framework I've developed that helps you move from being a professional into being uh, a researching accountant in academia. So that's the overall framework for today, what I'm hoping to cover. And I'm hoping in doing that, what I'm wanting to do is not just talk about you teaching other people, I'm wanting to talk about the, the issues facing academics. It was interesting that um, the stress of academics was higher up on um, Alan's chart in his paper than the, the stress of students. Um, and Greg was also commenting on the need to prioritize welfare of students and staff. So for me, it's, it's really important that we, we look at these personal perspectives as well as the, the content of what we might be teaching. Uh, if you want, you can go on to the link that Paul gave you yesterday and you can download the slides uh, and also the two blogs that I'm talking about. So those are the topics. And the first one I want to talk about is patterns of learning. So some of you will have heard a bit of this before, so I'm going to cover it rather briefly. Uh, but patterns of learning was research I did because the um, global body for accountants, IFAC, required all um, professional accountancy bodies to put in place compulsory CPD schemes and also to foster a, develop a, a commitment to lifelong learning but it uh, didn't define lifelong learning and it um, left it open as to how your schemes might actually operate. So my research was very much around um, what does learning look like? How does CPD and lifelong learning fit together um, in the 21st century? These are phrases and words we use, but what do they actually mean? And I came up with a framework, triangular framework, which generally meets approval. <laughs> can't be to triangle, I'm, I'm realising. So very much learning has moved from the top of this triangle down through it in the past 30 or 40 years. Um, you've got um, continuing professional education that we used to have that turned into co to continuing professional development, which then moved on to lifelong learning. Um, and that move has been reflected by a change in emphasis from just the cognitive aspect of learning to recognizing that you also need to look at the intrapersonal and interpersonal aspects of learning. So how you internalize what you're learning, how you reflect on what you're learning, 
and then how you learn with and from other people and with the context that you're working. And so there's been a move through in professional thinking about learning. And everybody's saying soft skills matter more these days. Well, this is really the subtext behind this, this framework that we're moving to where the intrapersonal and interpersonal aspects of learning are just as important as the other ones. So this was the theoretical framework, but then what might you put into the various sections? So you can actually populate this with learning activities. And of course, no learning activity relates just to one of these sections, but um, what you've got here is different aspects of learning. And if you make sure that your learning reflects all of these, you're going to be um, a pretty well prepared um, professional person. And you'll see that at the top, I'm suggesting that if your learning is just about education, about going on courses, technical updates, then I'm calling you an informed professional. If you're actually also learning at work, which of course is what professionals are meant to be doing, um, you're learning from other people and so on, I'm saying that you're a competent professional. And I think those top two layers are what would keep the FRC happy. Um, in that you're a safe pair of hands. But if you're looking at your own development, how you're moving forward, then what really matters is the bottom layer of the framework, which is about um, a concept that I'm describing as learning relating to career adaptability. And the bottom layer is very much, it's how I see lifelong learning now is working in practice. And it's very much around the ability to respond to things. Um, we talk a lot in academia about the word reflexive. Um, this is very much about being reflexive. It's about responding to anything that, if you like, that life throws at you and making sure that you are making the best of the situation. So that's the original framework um, that uh, um, I've shared previously. And what I want to do now is talk a bit more about adaptability, which is the concept across the bottom of the framework. So adaptability rules, this is my um, um, theory, if you like. And early on in the uh, pandemic, I asked myself whether it still did work, whether my framework did hang together with the um, circumstances that we were then in. And so I'm going to show you in this section, first of all, a bit more about career adaptability and then about how I think it did indeed hang together. So if we look at career adaptability, um, it's all the slides have got my nine triangles on. So this is very much taking you across from the, the blue triangle to the yellow triangle. So it's starting off with self-belief, which is right at the blue side of the main tri triangle which is about confidence in yourself and what you're doing. You then move across from that to a positive attitude, being optimistic about the future. Then you're moving across towards the interpersonal side where you come on first of all to experimenting, where you're willing to try out new ideas and then um, moving more to the interpersonal. You're then exploring, finding out what's happening out there whether it might be relevant to you. And then finally, you're actually engaging back to the good old idea of agency. So you've got identity and agency very much running across this whole framework. And indeed, you've also got um, emotional intelligence running across the bottom of this. Now, when Barbara was talking earlier on today, she was saying that people were a bit fed up with going to mindfulness sessions at lunchtime. Uh, and I can quite sympathize with that. But I do think that it is important to look at yourself in the context of these particular aspects that we've got. All of us as accountants are left brained. Um, you can tell we're all left brained because the slides we saw earlier today from all the presenters began with a whole load of figures about how many people were doing what and how much they were paying and how much income they were generating. So we are trained to be left brained. And these skills are really rather right-brained. And I didn't want this just to be a theoretical framework. So what I did do was develop some questions that you could ask yourself about your learning around each of the nine 
areas of the framework. So there is a toolkit. You're not supposed to read this. You're just supposed to get the idea that you can divide the framework up into three different lots of four triangles. Bit of overlap there, but uh, um, three different aspects around your learning. And uh, I am a groupie as far as attending the accounting education SIG is concerned. So I go there every year. And when I've been to the accounting education SIG, I met delegates who were from South Africa. Uh, and I actually went back to the SAAA, the South African Accounting Associations Conference um, a couple of years ago. And so if you want to see the toolkit in all its glory, actually where you can find it is at this link here, which is the um, um, SICO, the South African Institute's CPD resources, because I talked to them about this there and they couldn't wait to have enough of it. So you've got to free access to the whole resource on the on the SICA website. There's a certain issue here about profits not being recognized in their own country, but uh, that's been happening for centuries. So you've got the idea here of the framework and you can see that in each of the boxes there are some questions. And what I'm wanting to do is just take you across the bottom five triangles. So if I begin with self-belief. Now, when I was writing my blog on adaptability rules, I tested myself as to, in each of these areas, which is the one that seemed to be most relevant in the pandemic situation. So unlike Alan and Barbara and Greg, who are putting their paper together two months after it started, I actually wrote this blog one month after it started. And what was really interesting was that the one that I thought was the most relevant was the bottom one. It was the question about, are your emotions influencing your responses? Because I was realizing early on that I wasn't myself. I was living in a completely new, strange world. Um, and I could tell that I wasn't responding to things in the way I normally would. So I had to look after myself. I had to be aware of the fact that um, I was extra touchy, if you like, at times that I was not as rational as I might always be. And of course, the other side of that is that the people I was dealing with weren't. So for me, this was one of the big takeaways from this particular framework. You've got six areas here that you can think about, about your self-belief. But for me, in the pandemic context, it's the bottom one that was particularly important. And the one that I was reminded about today hearing the other speakers is the whole one about working up to your ability. I mean, it's all very well for me to have this in here, which is a way of encouraging people to stretch themselves. But actually, you could almost work out there should be a different phrase in here. You've had to move your ability sideways. You've had to do all sorts of other things. And I'm sure that self-belief will have been under threat during the past year. Your own confidence will have been under threat. Uh, and it would have been hard um, to um, keep your um, positive feelings going. I think it's been even more hard to look at keeping your confidence and competence in balance. This is one of the phrases in here that to me is critical, that you need to have those close enough together. If you're um, very, very competent, but not at all confident, then you won't put yourself forward to do things. Um, but if it's the opposite way around, that you're very confident, you might say you'll do things and then you haven't got the skills. Now in the pandemic, we've all had to do all sorts of extra things that we've never done before. So I think this has been a particular challenge. So this is the first part of the framework. And the second part, which really together make the self-efficacy that, that again, Alan was talking about, is the idea of having a positive attitude. So you've got half a dozen things here that you can look through and think, well, um, how am I doing on each of these? Are any of these, am I so bad at any of these that I'm, my attitude is seriously not positive? Um, or am I good enough at them? It's not about being perfect to any of these characteristics, it's about being good enough. Um, so, I mean, in the pandemic, looking ahead with an open mind is, uh, I mean, we just don't know what's happening. So very, very difficult to do. But the one I've picked out here, was very much around um, being proactive as a habit. So this was the one in April last year that I felt was the important one. 
it's about trying to make a difference to what's happening. It's about trying to, um, to the extent you can control things, trying to influence the areas where you have the opportunity to influence them. We've heard today of lots of examples of people being um, restricted by ceilings and walls around them that have un stopped them being able to make the decisions they wanted to make. But generally speaking, trying to make those decisions, being proactive is, is obviously a good habit. The other one that came through very much from the presentations today is around finding the strength to keep going and, and overcoming obstacles. I mean, we've heard that in spades and I've been incredibly impressed by all the academics I've heard talk about their experiences during the pandemic, about how well they have um, coped in such unusual circumstances. The third area across the bottom of the framework is experimenting. And here um, we've got half a dozen things that you could be doing if you were wanting to experiment. You could be curious, you could think about ways of growing as a person, you could try out new behaviours, uh, you could look at new knowledge, skills and experience. I know early on in the pandemic, I was signing up to every course that Future Learn produced that was about the pandemic. I was just obsessed with getting knowledge about it. <laughs> But for me, the one that was really important early on was piloting a new idea or approach to see if it works. Um, I think it's really interesting, this trying something out in order to see whether it works in scale or not. And you've had to do so many changes in the past year, but this was the one that came through to me at that particular point in time. The next area of moving towards the interpersonal end is about exploring. And for me, the half dozen aspects there that you can think about are, are on the slide. It's about finding out what's happening, getting information about choices you might need to make, contacting others with interests in common, thinking about how others might be thinking or feeling. So this is the other side of my earlier comment about your own emotions. It's actually thinking about well, what position is the other person in? Are they stuck at home? Have they got um, a really difficult situation at home? Is it hard to actually um, concentrate at all because of their circumstances? So it's about trying to empathize more than you might normally do because everybody is in such different circumstances. Um, and the one that I felt was the really important one was actually the, the first one, finding out what's happening to see if it's relevant. Um, because, I mean, there were so many things that we didn't know about that actually um, getting more knowledge early on in the pandemic was really, really helpful. And this whole exploring slide is actually very much around why you're all here today. You're actually here sharing interests in common. Um, you're here finding out what's happening. You're finding out what other people have been doing. Um, you're recognizing that your circumstances might be different to others, but nevertheless, you're still picking up ideas that can take away with you. And then the final area, when I was looking at my blog for this one, the one I chose from around here was communicating effectively in all contexts as one that was particularly relevant. I mean, all of these are about agency. They're about trying to make a difference. Um, they're about being able to work with other people, trying to shape your own future, interacting. But for me, it was the communicating that was really important. Um, and very much today, I've picked up the fact that lots of you have been having to have difficult conversations along the way. So, I mean, that's another communication skill that I hadn't necessarily thought about when I was writing my blog, but it was the, the one that came through to me. So I hope that's given you a, a feel of some of the softer issues that we can all be thinking about all the time. Um, in our development. I realise this is designed for not a COVID world and that you might look at this and think this all sounds a bit glib or a bit trite. So if it does, I apologise because um, this was prepared before that. 
but I hope that I've managed to emphasize some of the aspects that um, are particularly relevant at the moment and really emphasizing that it's about um, looking after yourselves um, and that really if you go across the bottom of the framework if you haven't got yourself in the right place then you're not able to do the other bits which are the teaching and so on so you actually need to um, look across the bottom areas and you've got these slides if you want to work through them and just think about you know what are the things I could be doing here and you might pick up one or two ideas that might help you so that's part two if you like of what I want to talk to you about the third thing I want to talk to you about is the researching accountant development framework so um, this is the framework that happened because um, I myself um, am relatively new to academia um, and when I arrived in academia it took some time to arrive there um, and to be accepted for what I was doing and in fact um, the Open University is, is where I'm, I'm based and um, what was really interesting is that all my colleagues at the Open University where I'm in the education faculty not the accounting faculty um, uh, as soon as I'd got a paper published on the work I'd been doing then they were absolutely you know I've, I've, I've arrived now they've all listened to me but this developing your academic persona was something that uh, I've been very aware of my own experience and I had a conversation with my mentor one day who said to me well actually Hillary if you look at your framework that you've come up with you've really identified nine learning spaces um, that um, could apply in any context. So what I then did was develop um, a framework that we're using across all the doctoral programmes at the Open University now that helps um, doctoral students develop as researchers. Uh, and the way that was done was by interviewing um, current and successful now doctors um, with their about their experiences and their learning while they were doing their journey and using their quotes to create a resource uh, and the resource was um, one where behind each of the areas each of these nine areas for example you could have a look at tips and hints and quotes from people about their learning experiences and then you could work out how they might apply to you and so the idea was formed that I did not just come up with something that was specific to the accountancy profession, which is where I did my original research, but actually I'd come up with a, a way of designing learning resources in any context. And so having done that at the Open University and had a couple of papers published, so again, it seemed to have um, um, proper credibility. Um, I then recognised my own situation when I'd moved from being a um, fledgling researcher if you like when I was starting off on my doctoral journey at the Open University um, to being fully fledged and so I did a second piece of research which was with accountancy professionals who had moved into academia and who were at various stages of their careers um, some were professors some had only just made the move about their learning experiences around the whole issue of trying to develop research capability. Because for me, um, my own credibility in academia um, grew exponentially once I'd been able to create some new knowledge, if you like. And so whether that's in, in research or whether that's around scholarship, the fact that you've found out something new um, puts you in a different place, I think. And for me, if you're in academia, but you're not doing that inquiring yourself, you're perhaps missing out. So the research led to a framework that some of you I know are familiar with, um, which was very much um, around those nine triangles. So it ended up in nine fancy boxes. Um, the whole resource is available on the ICAW Academia and Education Community. So you've got a link there to where the resource is. Uh, I'll tell you what all the words are in a minute, but these are their pretty pictures, if you like. Uh, and if you do go onto the community there, anybody can join the community. It's open access, it's free of charge. And there are a whole load of really good blogs there. So I'm talking about two of mine today, but 
Jenny Rose, who's on this call, and Joan Ballantyne have both written fantastic pieces for that, um, that blog. So there's lots of good resources there that you could be, you could be looking at. So what are the words behind the pictures? And these are the words that emerged from my research. So these are different to the original framework. So these are the, the thematic analysis end product, if you like, at the top level. What were the nine areas of learning that people talked about? And you'll see I've got three main areas here. I've got um, developing your knowledge and skills, which is very much focused around the cognitive aspect of learning, the traditional aspect of learning, if you like. I've got changing yourself and I've got changing your world because um, Aldous Huxley in about 1931, I think, um, commented that you couldn't hope to change the world, you could only hope to change yourself. Um, but my theory is that if you change yourself, you can have a go at changing your bit of the world. <laughs> So these were why I came up with the two titles for these other areas. And all I'm going to do now is just go through the, the um, areas in a bit more detail and give you a couple of quotes from people to give you a flavor of what's in the resource. But you've got some quite long quotes in the resource. You've got tips and hints, things to think about. So if you're thinking about what will I do next with my um, researching, my career as a possible researcher in academia, this will help you. Also, if you're already an established researcher and you read through this, it will refresh your enthusiasm and help you remember that, oh, yes, everybody has difficulties with certain things. So um, it, it's a resource that's, that's there that I hope will stand the test of time. So just going through it a little bit. So the. Oh, and before I get onto the resource, the, the, the only other bit of it I want to mention before I get onto the detail is that there is a um, downloadable Word document. This is high tech, but very practical, um, where when you've worked through the resource, the resource, you can put down any action points you want to follow through on yourselves. So then if we just go through the, the areas, the first area around knowledge and skills, the three key bits that came out were understanding research, what it was all about, whether you were going to be active in research or not, you needed to understand what it could bring to the party. It's about engaging with others. And in particular, there was enormous support for trying to find a mentor and about bringing research to practice. So how does your research relate to what you're trying to teach? How can you bring that into what you're sharing whether it's about technical topics or whether it's about the, the pedagogy of teaching. And a few quotes about knowledge and skills. First of all, there's a wonderful quote here. There's no right answer. Research is gray. I think if you come across to academia, you um, find this grayness quite hard. And if you're a professional accountant who is by instinct left brained, you find gray sometimes quite a difficult color. <laughs> So um, I think here what you've got is recognition that this is a different way of thinking. I know when I started doing my professional doctorate and I'd been working in the business school at the Open University before, I was quite horrified because I was suddenly on the social sciences side, but I wasn't allowed to number paragraphs. <laughs> I mean, you've just got to learn that this whole thing is more amorphous than you thought it might be. Second quote, the parameters are different. It's a different game. It's about learning the rules of the game. So this is all about respecting the genre. It's very much about recognizing that research, uh, the whole research profession has its way of doing things. And when you arrive mid-career possibly with a fantastic career behind you, but to a new world, you very much need to respect the genre and understand what it is, um, what good looks like in that new world. And then third quote, self-evident about the mentor. The second area, which is one that I think is even more important at the moment, and I recognise that talking about doing research might be hard when you've all been saying earlier on today that the time for research is being more limited. But it does mean that if you're wanting to do anything about research, you need to be more focused. And this would help you be more focused. You need to think about how it's affecting you 
So the first area here is very much about thinking things through. Do I need to do a doctorate or not? Am I required to do a doctorate? Where do I want my career to go? Um, what will I be happy with in 10 years, in 20 years? And therefore, what do I need to think about doing at the moment? Then a huge area about how you may be affected. This is when you first get involved in doing research. It could be enormous issues around confidence that you thought you were quite good at writing and you suddenly discover you're not. You thought you were quite good at criticizing things and then you discovered that's different to being critical. Um, if you arrive with a professional qualification, but you haven't got um, academic credentials, then other people may not think that you're arriving fully formed, that you've still got something else that you need to add to your armory. So there are big issues and really interesting quotes in the resource about how people um, could be affected by that move into um, possibly into research. And it may indeed be how people are being affected at the moment in any event by all the changes that are being required of them as their jobs are beginning to change. The shape of their jobs might be different in the future. None of us know what the new normal will look like. And then the third area that came out around here was developing resilience. So we've been talking about resilience a lot today. There's a, one thing we haven't talked about today is coping with feedback, but I know that anybody on this um, call who's been involved in um, academic studies um, or in submitting publications um, will know that coping with feedback can be a tricky process. And it's whether you can separate yourself and your personal investment in what you've written from the fact that somebody is criticizing the words you have written and trying to help you make the words better and make your case better for you. Enormous issue about finding time for research and study, and that's obviously even harder at the moment. And then the whole question of managing your workload. Um, you are all very dedicated to your students. When I chair meetings of the Institute's Academia and Education Advisory Group, and I say, how are you all feeling? You're all worrying about how your students are feeling. And it's really hard to find out how you're feeling about the pandemic and more generally. So you're really, really dedicated to your students. And so when you're managing your workload, it's then how do you manage to find the time to do other things as well um, while still looking after your students? So a few quotes about changing yourself. I think it's hard um, because you feel like it's a totally different space in academia. I've never felt so unsure of myself and so lacking in confidence. One thing I didn't appreciate I would take so personally was the critique. And then the third area is around changing your world. So this is very much about what impact you might have, what difference you might make. And it's so easy for people to focus on the top part of the triangle, the knowledge and skills. And then they've got enough trouble with how they're feeling about this and the personal journey they're going on. But then if you can help them understand what are the things you might be able to do at the end of all this once you've um, become research active, um, then you can see that this is a payback for all the <laughs> pleasure and, and a lot of pain <laughs> involved in the journey. And so um, here we're talking about the importance of being proactive, um, pursuing your interests, trying things out, the importance of developing your networks. So again, being here today, attending conferences, talking about your research. So you've got other people that can then um, join in with your conversation. It makes you realize you're not just doing it in a corner somewhere, you're doing it with colleagues, publishing your research. And then the final area across the bottom of the framework is making a difference, um, which is about the excitement of finding out something new, but it's also about contributing to society and to the accountancy profession. And as I said, the resource that we've got it's very much got um, in it lots of quotes from people about their own 
journeys and experiences and learning as researchers. So it's something that when you when you're able to come up out of the water and take a deep breath and think about research again, um, there are some resources here that will help you do so effectively. And then the fourth area I want to talk about um, here is is um, sorry, we've got some quotes here. So academic conferences and the networking at conferences are really important. The first conference I presented at was probably one of the most terrifying things I ever did. And finding out something new would be so exciting. And then the final area I want to talk about um, is the other blog I wrote later on the year, which I called Some Things Never Change. And the reason why I did it was that we had a discussion at the academia and education group where we were recognizing that uncertainty was the enormous issue. This is what some Greg referred to earlier today as extreme uncertainty, um, but that we were all recognizing that some form of blended hybrid learning um, could well be um, the way forward. And so I thought, hmm, this sounds strangely familiar to me. And so I wrote a blog about some things called some things never change. And there were three or four topics that I mentioned. The first one I mentioned was um, talked about was learning at a distance. So, I mean, this perennial, sorry, this blended hybrid learning model has been around actually in various forms for a long time. Um, as I said, I've been at the Open University. We called it distance learning there. Uh, and so we've been doing it for quite some time. And in fact, um, I met Alan Sankster, who's a bit of a uh, a loop here. The, if you look at, at the Sangster et al. paper at the end of it, the reviewer of the paper is somebody called David Tyrrell. And David writes in there about the fact he was involved at the Open University with their Certificate in Management course that was launched in about 2000. And Alan was in fact the um, professor there who was launching the scheme. And I was one of the associate lecturers so I was very involved in that. And so David and my paths must have crossed, although I, rec I confess I can't recall him. Um, and that framework then, that course then in 2000, had in it every form of media you could think about. And we even had as one of the 12 of, 12 of the 16 modules, we had a CD-ROM on law, because Alan was determined that we ought to have a CD-ROM in there as well as everything else. And so some of these things have been going on for a long time. And it's just working out what's best for the student experiences. The second thing for me that never changes is, is fears about using technology. And we've talked about that earlier today. And for me, some of the fears are, um, I mean, every time I log on to a Zoom call, I'm sort of quite pleased when it all works, particularly if I'm speaking. Uh, and I can remember 20 years ago, um, when I was studying one course at the Open University and it was it was um, about managing knowledge and we were all supposed to go onto an online platform and I couldn't connect and I can remember how helpless I felt and I didn't know if it was the platform that wasn't working that day or if it was me or it was the fact that, wait for it, this is a good line, this, that my laptop only had 32 gigabytes of RAM and I really needed 64. That was the recommended minimum. So, so this getting onto technology has always been an issue, but you just need to recognize it. And as Alan was saying earlier today, we all need to become more professional about it. I think this general recognition that some face-to-face -face is good in every learning environment, and that's never changed. And I think the problem of trying to get people to, who in a classroom would sit on the back row to engage in the online situation is really hard. Um, I was talking in the breakout rooms just now about some problems around that, just trying to get people to engage. So these are issues that have never changed, but we're having to face up to them now because we have no choice. But the other thing that hasn't changed is that there are three ways of learning. Um, and so for me, what's really important is working out if we're doing this blended hybrid learning, working out 
what's the best way to deliver the cognitive aspects of a syllabus, the, the knowledge and understanding? What's the best way to deliver the intrapersonal aspects of learning to students? What's the best way to deliver the interpersonal aspects? Some of those will be better done um, online, some of those will be better done face to face, some of those will be better done privately. So there's a whole really interesting area here um, about when you're looking to the future. Um, Alan was talking about you need to provide what students need and help them use technology properly. But then Barbara was saying that uh, you need to look at how you're going to design modules that stand the test for the next five years. And I think part of that standing the test for the next five years is very much around working out which aspects of learning are best suited to being delivered in different ways. And you can then look at your um, approach in that light. So that's, that's me done. Um, you've got a couple of pages of slides of references and so on. And then um, I will stop sharing my screen and hand back to Sarah or Joan if Joan's here. <laughs> Hilary, thank you very much indeed for uh, for that. That was uh, uh, very enlightening. And uh, as I, I said in the comment, I think that uh, what you've said, we all are, are sort of have in the back of our mind. We perhaps haven't had the time to to actually sit back and reflect on all those things. But there, uh, and maybe this is now the time to to take take that five minutes to do so because we. we I, I, Feel as a profession we haven't had that opportunity and maybe we we don't think that we're going to have that opportunity come the summer because we're all going to be designing what we need for next uh, for next year but I think it is vitally important that we do all just uh, step back and, and as leaders of, of teams and things I think we, we need to lead by example and to actually take that step back off the wheel for a moment um, and enable our teams to do that um, as well so there's some uh, really important things in there and, and I say from the from the mix of universities that uh, that are here and represented, I think there's probably uh, um, you know so you've, you've had Greg's in, um, in, institution, which is highly intensive uh, on a research basis, um, to you know, perhaps somewhere um, where Paul is in Winchester, which is more teaching based, uh, uh, and yet you have members of staff who are uh, still trying to find their way in the in the academic um, in the academic world. So um, I think your framework is. Um, it is real, really good food, food for thought and actually uh, confidence building, I think, um, in there as well. So um, I don't know if anybody has any uh, um, comments that they want to. Uh, I'm just going to have a little look in the in the comments in there uh, to see if anybody wanted to. Uh, to um, I think uh, earlier on, Darren had a question for uh, Hillary on the original um, uh, on the original. Um, on your original diagram, um, what do you do if the two bottom layer, if you've got the two bottom layers and not the top one? This was to do with your your very first one, where you were talking about the the different types of learners that you or the professionals that you that you were. So I don't know what you would describe somebody like that, Hilary. What's, what's an interesting question? I'm not quite sure. I mean, it, it, it's not a person. It's saying these are the ways that you need to be learning. And, and, and if you haven't got the knowledge and skills, well, that's, that's the starting off point really, isn't it? You need to work out what you need to know first. Um, many of the other skills, the, the, the second and third layers, are actually transferable. I mean, the bottom layer is, is pretty well transferable across lots and lots of contexts. The middle layer is transferable across quite a few. The top one is, of course, um, context specific that you need to have the knowledge and skills for whatever it is that you're doing but in many ways as professional accountants people just take that for granted for us so when, when you're interviewing people you're probably interviewing them for their, for their interpersonal skills rather than for their knowledge so, uh, a good point there um, so just come in, Sarah. sorry could yeah, you say hi. just say thanks to, to hillary i thought it was really really interesting and i asked that question when you first put up the triangle, so there was just the word courses there. Um, so actually, the question was answered a little bit later on when you okay. broke that down into lots of different um, areas. Um, so yeah, I totally understand what you're saying now. Thank you. 
Okay, so uh, thank you for thank you for that, Darren. So, is is has anybody any other uh, questions or comments for, uh, uh, for for Hillary on there? I mean, it's certainly something I uh, I mean I work in a team with um, a, a mixture of both academics and um, uh, accountants who have come from the profession. I am one of those myself, uh, and I think this would actually be a really useful useful tool. And I don't actually know how many of my members of staff will have looked at it. Uh, and given that we are tasked with scholarship every year. Uh, uh, and it's been a difficult year to do any of that. I think this would actually be a, a really good, we've talked about the, some of the training sessions and starting to train staff. I think this might be, uh, whilst down the research side, uh, I think this might be a really good uh, opening gambit for the for a, for a department um, meeting or a, a, you know, a team meeting just to get people uh, back on track as well, because I, I think we have all focused so much on the teaching side, which we've had to, uh, but I think we, we need to give people that breathing space and that time to uh, time to, to um, uh, think and focus and find that in find the find that new idea and find that new uh, that new side of things because that's uh, that's really important and I say I think uh, it's certainly something I got to uh, go back and, and take with me when I go uh, go back. So. Uh, Sort of following on from the, the, the you know the, the different speeches that you know talks that we've had today, all of them uh, really really enlightening. And to say, and it is it, what I found interesting is that a the same thing seems to be happening in my institution or pretty much in my institution as everywhere else. So that provides a little bit of comfort. Um, but equally, I think we are all facing the same um, uncertainty and issues and 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 I just wonder whether um, sort of in the light of what we've talked about today and you know what we've learned from last year how do we uh, think that uh, as accounting and finance departments we're going to need to change um, in the next year what are our priorities you know and, and if that's the case what role potentially could CDAF play in helping you achieve some of those priorities or bringing them to the forefront um, of, uh, you know, raising the, raising the profile of some of those issues where we can. I appreciate some might be uh, more local, but do, does anybody, anybody like to uh, um, address what priorities they might be uh, thinking about in their departments? No. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting, it's a, I suppose it's a, uh, I, I mean, I've, Greg made the, the comment earlier about um, the fact that nobody is yet willing to, to sort of jump off the, par uh, the, the parapet and actually put, or put their hand up and say, this is what we're going to be doing next year. We all seem to be followers and we're waiting for that one university to, 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 to take, the, uh, take the step and the rest of us are going, oh yes, we'll all do that. That's, you know, that's what we want. To, we were going to do that as well, sort of thing. Uh, Jenny, you were uh, waving your hand. Yeah, I can say what we were doing. We've, um, last week it was announced that the university just, just the, student, the university announced to students that they would be um, able to choose whether they were online or not, which was a massive sigh for me because that means we've got to do hybrid teaching, which we've not done before. So at Manchester, we've always been a hotspot for COVID. So we managed to teach online for the whole of last semester and this last two semesters. But as of September, we'll be finally teaching online and teaching face-to-face. -face. So it really is getting to the bottom of the blended uh, learning and trying to um, use nudging techniques and unlock techniques to try and um, pull in those back row students, as you say, into the room to get them learning just as well as the top third that really, really thrive on blended learning. So at first it was a big sigh, but now I think it could work quite well. And then it'll be even harder next semester in January going back to completely face to face. <laughs> And are you, do you feel you're getting the, the support resource wise to do that side of things? Because that's a resource intensive potentially if you're having to deliver face to face and then record bits and pieces to, to, to a company for the online side of things. No. <laughs> OK, no, well, that's honest. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> no, I, I like the way Greg was talking about his, his work allocation model being completely changed. I think the work allocation model does need to change because it's completely different. It's no longer now one hour lecture prep, one hour lecture plus four hours prep. It's vastly different to that. And I don't have any answers, but I thought um, it was interesting how Greg's university did that. And, and I would like to see others follow because I think the work is very, very different. OK, um, Brian, you've got your hand up. So, uh, Brian. 
Yeah, I, th I think uh, so. Going back to what Greg was saying about timetabling earlier on, it, it, I think at present it's very difficult to look beyond the timetabling issue, um, which is dependent on social isolation. Um, so sorry, social distancing. Uh, and as I understand it, in in Wales, um, the government are going to make some sort of uh, decision, but that's not going to happen until June, partly because um, we've got an election today, I guess. Uh, the universe, my university is hiding behind that, um, not making a decision. Uh, and it, it's so difficult to to think. It, you know, in terms of the actual delivery and, and what staff prepare and, and stuff like that until we decide how much of it is going to be face to face, how much is it of it is going to be online. And as, you know, as Jenny was saying, if, if it's hybrid and if, if we're letting students uh, study remotely, which no doubt we will for overseas students, um, I just I, I just have this feeling that we're, we're totally in limbo at present and it is almost worse than it was this time last year when you know in the in that first lockdown there was a, a an element of uh, of certainty about going forward which uh, which we don't have at present okay um, uh, Darren you had your hand up as well thanks sorry I think Paul was before me but okay. I'll, I'll, I'll jump um, in Paul um yeah, my, my point was really about um, something that we, we we seem to have overlooked, and that is if we're going to be um, working online, we've overlooked the fact that, you know, 18, 19 year old students, even through to final year undergraduate and some postgraduate, um, they don't know how to organise their time, they don't know how to manage themselves. Uh, you know, they've, m many of them will not have had jobs, so they're not used to that sort of organisation of even getting up in the morning. Um, and, and, you know, certainly we didn't do anything really to help students other than issue a timetable of seminars. And we just said, yeah, there's a load of asynchronous materials. Do them in your own time, uh, but turn up to your seminar. Um, and, and they just weren't organised. Um, I mean, that's that's assuming that they want to engage in the first place. So the second thing to follow that up would be that, um, and it goes back to a lot of stuff we talked about earlier, that if all, all we're going to expect um, from students in terms of assessment is for them to regurgitate back to us what's on our slides and notes and everything else from, from asynchronous materials, etc., cetera, um, then they won't engage all year. And it's just easier for them to not engage if they're, you know, supposedly learning from home on an online basis, because all they need to do is wait till the end of the year, try and get some exam tips, uh, and then just have a look at the relevant material. So if if we don't work on our assessment and style of teaching, that makes it easier for students to get away with not organising them, themselves, not attending, not engaging, and, and that is you know is even easier for them to get away with when we're in a blended learning environment. Yeah, we, uh, I think, that, but we had a, a conversation earlier on when we were talking about some of the uh, embedding the skills side of things that the uh, that Emma had talked about, um, sort of sharing some of her material in terms of that skills. Um, you, you know, but it is a, a big thing, and again, it goes back to the staff training as well. We we. We need to invest in our in our staff. We've you know we've been expected to be able to do all of these things with a few online courses and get on with it sort of thing, um, without actually the time to go back to the pedagogy of of understanding um, what we're trying to what we're trying to do. If I go to Paul next, because I think you were next, and then uh, Stephen, and then Greg, you're on mute, Paul. Sorry, I, I just muted myself when I thought I'd unmuted myself in a, in a perfectly timed demonstration how it, how easy it is to make a horse's ass of anything online. Um, it kind of uh, picking up on Darren's point, and this the, yeah, this wasn't planned. I think certainly, understandably, we we spent an awful lot of time and effort panicking about how on earth are we going to teach online. Uh, and probably didn't spend as much time thinking about how on earth are our students going to learn online. 
Uh, and certainly what we found this year is that we, we had massively overestimated uh, our students' abilities, um, both, um, both at high level in terms of you know, organising their time and being self-motivated enough to, to, to join the online classes, but also at, at quite um, operational levels, such as if the students are in a, a house where they're having to share a room with someone else, it might not even be possible for them to have the speakers on their laptop on. They might be just listening on a pair of earphones and not able to talk. And even practical things like that uh, was something that we kind of learned as we went along, uh, rather than um, uh, being able to plan for that. And I, I said in the breakout room, I. I kind of got lulled into a false sense of security because the first course that I did this year was way back in July 2020 and that was on an executive MBA and not only did I have the luxury of being able to plan that from first principles knowing it was going to be online rather than having to crash a classroom course online uh, because it was an executive MBA course you couldn't get a word in edgeways. All the students had their cameras on, they were all ready to contribute to the class, they'd all done the prep work beforehand. Uh, it was great. And then in the last week of September, for the first time, I hit the, the undergraduate teaching experience. Um, and uh, some, I, I can't remember who said, but someone said they felt as if they were a DJ, just, just talking into the void. And I kind of thought in my own mind, yeah, well, if that was me, it was probably sub Alan Partridge, actually, the experience that I had teaching a row of icons on the screen. So I think maybe one of the lessons that comes out of this is that we take a much more active and strategic approach to managing our students and, and cluing them up in terms of, well, this is how we're going to teach and this is how it works and this is our expectations and the, these are the minimum resources that you need and so on and so forth, but almost try to think from first principles about how we equip them with the skills for whatever blended learning we're planning. I mean, for years we've we've given induction sessions to students on how to use the library and, and that sort of thing. And maybe we need to start giving them induction sessions on how to use Zoom and how to organize their time and how to how to make a separation from work and study if everything's happening in the same place. But to take a much more strategic approach this year than than sort of frantically throwing everything together at the last minute. Yep, I agree. I hope we have the slightly the benefit of time but then obviously we've got all the assessment period to happen and everything else in between so, so suddenly and then uh, we'll be back in September before we before we know it. Um, uh, Stephen you had your hand up as well Stephen Frost. I think the, our basic assumption is that some students will not be on campus so we've got to accommodate for them but otherwise it's a repeat of the first semester this year but without a lockdown uh, and in practice that means that any class with less than 60 students will be taught in person um, classes with up to around about 300 students, no, probably up to 200 students, will get one hour every other week in person. And, and classes with modules with class sizes of 250, 300, will get um, every third week, something like that. And all the rest will be on demand. That's, that's, that's the planning assumption. Okay, that's interesting. The assumption is that most of the material we've created for this year, we'll be able to reuse for, for, this, for next year. All right, that's a um, interesting um, because we've sort of battered that idea about a little bit, um, but I think there's a a parity of um, student experience has been uh, sort of battered back to to as the um, as the reason that we might not do that particular um, route just because somebody happens to be in a smaller module. Why should they get more uh, time? But I, that's that's what the argument that's been battered back uh, at us potentially, but. Um, uh, only because, because because it's possible. Yeah. You know, we can't. We don't have any lecture theatres which will allow social distancing and class sizes more than sixty. So. Yeah. Oh, interesting. There we are. Now, that's we don't have any class sizes less than sixty. So <laughs> there's not going to be many of them. No. Uh, Greg, you had your hand up as well, and then uh, Emma. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to mention that uh, the, the reaction to Stephen's point, but I'll, but I'll mention that first. I find it really strange to give such an unequal um, service to the students on larger courses compared with smaller courses, I would find that difficult to justify, particularly seeing as in general, 
in my institution, the people on the bigger courses are the people paying the highest fees. Um, so I'd find that very difficult to justify. But the point I was going to mention was in relation to Darren's um, about the, if you like, time management issues. Um, let's be honest, many of us have many time management problems. Um, but st- I think it's, been, it's well known that students are not very good at time management. I think I wrote something some years ago, which which concluded that was one of the major skills that students needed. And it's something that's very, very difficult to induce in students. What part of our Moodle minimum standard was that all courses should have, um, I think we called it a study budget. I didn't like that term very much, which was how many hours does it take to do this course? And how much does it take to do individual parts of this course? Preferably, although this was essential, with some provision and allocation of that over the period that the course was on. Um, which was a very good idea, um, a very sensible idea. It's what you what you tend to see in the best online courses. But it is one of the things which I have to say, most staff were most found most difficulty doing um i you know in the sense that i mean it just wasn't it was the one it was the thing most missing in most of the courses when we look um i'm not sure whether it's because staff aren't willing to commit or whether staff just don't know or staff just weren't getting around to that because it wasn't the most important thing which is it's kind of curious because we we all know how bad students are at managing their time. We all know how how students gauge their expectations from what you plonk in front of them as opposed to what you ask them to do. Um, and I think it's really curious as to how we get around this this issue. And I'd like to see how this how these other people are doing these these, these inductions or. I hate the term onboarding. Um, we use it with staff all the time, but um, but I know what you mean. How we, how we do that in order to get students to understand that the course is not just crash crashing the look read through the slides the day before the the test. Um, I don't think it's a really interesting point, really, how we do that. Anyway, thank, thank you, Greg. So Emma, you had your hand up as well. So Emma. I mean, I was just going to agree, actually, with the points that probably Paul and Greg have raised. I mean, I think like others, we were so consumed with how the heck we were going to deliver our teaching, some online, some not online, how we timetable it, how we'd not timetable it, um, that we forgot that actually our students needed to be educated in how to use those um, materials as well. And I think we have now recognised that. And I know we don't like, I don't like the word onboarding either. That's what the university are going to call it is to onboard and reboard our students. In fact, we've, take, we've had to take a week of teaching out of our first semester next year to enable a university-wide onboarding activity in terms of um, getting students ready to study at university, which is the sort of thing we would have done for an international students at PG, historically. Um, we haven't yet seen the content of that. I think the other thing that I was um, quite interested about is the decisions about timetabling for next academic year. So my institution has made commitments to how much face-to-face and online activity there will be for students, but they haven't then told us how to deliver it. And when we've actually looked at what they've asked us to deliver, if we remain with a one metre social distancing at campus estate, we can't deliver it. So it's going to be quite interesting as, a, as an exercise. Sorry, I've just got a child come home from school, walked into my office. Give me a sec. Sorry, I'd finished anyway. <laughs> no, thank Apologies. you. Thank, no, thank you, Emma. Um, Vijay, you had your uh, hand up, so... Uh... Yeah, so just that uh, um, a lot of good points have been made about teaching and learning in the new uh, setup next year. I, d- I was just wondering about the thorny issue of assessment because uh, how long are we going to continue with a scenario where we're setting three hour closed book exams but allowing them to be set open book over 24 hours and that's been continuing since the time COVID started how long are we going to continue like this because if 
with large classes, if you can't teach them uh, on site, there's even less chance of our being able to assess them on site. So is there a prospect of the professional bodies permitting us to use coursework instead of exam? I don't know the answer to that question, but uh, that's something which is really troubling me personally, because I don't think we are actually doing any favors to our students by assessing them in this way. So again, a, a very interesting, because I, I mean, I I saw Greg shaking, you said, I mean, I, I, we obviously, it's not an accreditation uh, and assessment uh, uh, session, which I we know. are running at the beginning of September, VJ. So uh, <laughs> please do sign up for that on the 10th of September, where the professional <laughs> okay, bodies right. will be on hand to, to answer the questions. I, I, I agree. I don't foresee that happening um, at this particular point, um, but there is certainly, um, I think everybody's doing assessments slightly differently in terms of um, some people have got time constraints, some people have got uh, the 24 hour window still that they can uh, they can use. I appreciate probably for the exemption exams which qualify for exemptions, students do have less less time in that uh, to, you know, it may be time constrained, uh, but I think there's still a mix. I mean, we've had a conversation in our university about uh, the fact that so we, ha we had a, you know, we had a bit of a, the students, yeah, uh, complaining that the first time around, so this time last year when we ran exams, we gave them 24 hours because that was the what we did. Come Christmas time in January, we for the exemptions, we took them down to three hours. So we time constrained uh, to try and uh, improve the robustness of the papers, etc. And the uh, and that way, and the students were then complaining that, well, how come I had somebody last year had 24 hours to do what I'd been asked to do. But, you know, we, the argument was we've changed the assessment we have changed this the way that we're writing our assessments um and and going forward uh, i think if we were to change for, and lose the 24 hours for some students we're then going to for, for everybody we're going to have uh, um that that same same old debate coming uh, coming through but it's a I, I think it might be worth having another workshop at some stage i know we've got the one with the professional bodies on assessment but that might be something that maybe we could put in a a, a meeting um over the summer, perhaps, or something—a workshop over the over the summer—to see how what people are planning to do. I know it, assess the accreditation aside, uh, but that might be something that uh, as, you know we can then um, get a bit more of a feel for feel for what everybody's is actually doing. Because I know Joan and I um, surveyed the surveyed everybody um, going into the pandemic, and that was written up in the uh, the blog that Joan Joan wrote. Uh, but that might be something that we could we could follow up on. The reason I mentioned it is obviously because the way we teach is going to be closely linked to the way we assess. So we can't really separate the two. So that's, that's the reason I mentioned it. So. Yeah. But has anybody else got, I mean, uh, accreditation aside, because obviously that's a, um, you know, it's not it's not a, uh, my gift or anything like that or uh, to, to comment on that. But has anybody else got any plans for the way that they're looking to, uh, to assess it? Katrina, you've got your hand up. Yes, it wasn't about assessment, actually. Um, I did kind of put this in the chat, but I find a lot of people being quite negative um, and kind of depressed about the situation. And actually, I think um, I did put in the chat, you know, I, I went to a blended learning conference and it wasn't accounting based. It was more general than that. And a lot of the conversations were really very similar where people were saying, well, they don't put their cameras on and they don't do this and they don't do that. And as someone pointed out, well, actually, things are looking up because the people who are coming to us next year have had at least one year with a significant proportion of that at home learning using technology. So one, a lot of the issues that we've had where things switched on and people didn't have the technology and things, hopefully we won't have going forward um, because students have been learning at school through online learning and things. So it might actually get a bit better next year. That's what I'm hoping. That's an interest. I, 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 I like your positivity. I, uh, I hope that that is, uh, that is the case. Um, but if, so that, as you say, uh, maybe they do, we do, we are underestimating the, the fact that the, the skills uh, and the technology might well come with, with some, some students, not, uh, not necessarily uh, all uh, in there. Um, but Paul, you've got your hand up. It, it was just to add a note of positivity, really. Just as a data point, we're actually uh, doing some optimistic planning for next academic year. And our baseline assumption is that everything is, 
and I stress this is a baseline assumption that everything is back to normal and all the students are in class with no social distancing. Um, now, the caveat to this, of course, is that we are a small university. We don't have uh, huge lectures. It would be unusual for one of our classes to get into triple figures. So we can accommodate that a little bit more easily maybe than other uh, places can. Um, we obviously have got a plan B for, for what happens if we can't have everyone in the room at the same time, but certainly the, the baseline assumption is that life is going to look a little bit more normal uh, than it did just looking at things like uh, removal of restrictions and, and vaccination rates and, and everything like that. So we're, we're taking a cautiously optimistic view, I think. Anybody else's uh, institutions being cautiously optimistic? No, no. Uh, I say I think there's the the uh, we've got we're going we've got the issue of with with the with our international students coming in. Sarah, I'll come to to you in a in a second. With our international students coming in, uh, as to how we deal with the the operational side of of quarantine and vaccines and all that side of things as well so that's a uh, but uh, uh, an issue that we we need to uh, uh, be considerate of but uh, so listen to the discussion it, it would seem that we've got uh, a mixture of delivery mechanisms uh, in, uh, uh, in in the planning process anyhow uh, Sarah yeah well we are we, we I just came out of a, a meeting uh, about timetabling this morning which was quite long and then we decided somehow on a blended uh, approach uh, where we try to deliver as much uh, on site for level six students uh, to give them that kind of experience of you know compensating hopefully for what they have lost uh, over the last uh, year or so um, but then we're going to have another meeting today at five o'clock because things have changed already so <laughs> that can give you an idea about how things change in our institution but our biggest challenge really has been and I don't know may it continue to be IT because we've had a cyber attack uh, on top of everything else and we have lost our timetabling system we have lost all kinds of Moodle access to a certain extent and we still have issues with that. So I really hope and I'm being not very optimistic that things will be restored back to normal by um, by the start of the new academic year. Um, so that is our challenge really. It, it is that kind of IT support and I am aware that other universities have been facing some IT uh, uh, issues as well where they had um, cyber attacks which was the case for us uh, back in December. Um, staff well-being is another one because um, it I can see staff, you know, being feeling it basically, and I'm one of them. And uh, we don't seem we're going to go to the market and we're recruiting, but I'm not sure how much we can do in terms of resources to support um, our staff, especially because, again, and I think it has been mentioned before, admin support hasn't been quite there in fact it has been reduced dramatically in, in certain instances um, and yes assessment is another challenge and I am arguing for not having the 24-hour exams at all next year um, and I think I will be heard hopefully and again I'm being very optimistic and every day is we're in the same institution so we know <laughs> we know the challenges that we have been having um, with our suggestions because we are the only division that has the exams really in the entire business school which is quite um, challenging uh, to put our points across sometimes um, and uh, yeah and, and making sure that we innovate in all of this and try to seize the opportunity of being innovative and doing uh, great stuff um, which has been a challenge because we didn't have the time and we've been really managing the crisis after crisis uh, since the start of the pandemic and obviously with the IT issue as well. So hopefully we will find the time to innovate and, and, and be creative and do some fabulous stuff uh, that we would probably have not done if it wasn't for the pandemic. So, yeah. Um. Oh, thank you. For, thank you for that. And that's a, an interesting one. Joan, Joan has uh, uh, just come back in and uh, said to me, where are we on the schedule? And I'm about to be able to say, 
we're bang on four o'clock and we've had a fantastic uh, discussion this afternoon. So she uh, she might, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't have done such a good job and she uh, she uh, would uh, uh, come back in on time. Uh, but we've had, you know, we've had some really interesting um, uh, talks there this afternoon, Joan. Um, I'm sorry you, you missed them. Um, uh, and I think uh, so from the discussions that we've had, I think there's so many different issues and priorities. I mean, we've just talked there, the IT uh, assessment, um, but I think probably staff well-being and staff training, I think, is a, is probably the one thing that we we need to uh, to consider how we we drive that forward as well to ensure that our staff do have the skills to uh, to do what we're being asked to do. Uh, but under the auspices of as we started the very, at the beginning of the day, saying there isn't any more money to uh, to enable you to to do any of these things. So uh, um, it, that's going to be the the challenge for all of us. So. Uh, Thank you all very much for your uh, contributions in terms of uh, to our uh, uh, four uh, speakers. Obviously, Alan isn't with us to thank in person, but I'm sure that we will uh, uh, be able to do so via um, digital means. Um, uh, but to uh, um, to. Uh, Barbara, uh, to Greg and to Hilary, uh, thank you very much indeed for your uh, uh, input to our uh, um, our workshop, our conference this year. I think it's been uh, really, really interesting uh, to hear so many different perspectives and uh, say honest and personal um, reflections on what uh, what we're facing. Uh, and as a committee member of CDAF, please do as they put it in the, the chat or if you if you um, if you think of something at a later stage, please do drop uh, me or any of the committee members a, an email saying um, we've got this issue. Can CDAF look at this for us or can CDAF put a workshop on? Because this is what we're trying to, to, to do is to try and ensure that as a network, we support our members as best we uh, as best we can. And, and whilst we Try and keep coming up with the the, the different uh, elements of, and the different workshops etc it may be that we're missing something that uh, uh that everybody else thinks oh it'd be a good idea if we did or we had some training on, on that so there's a few things coming out from what we've uh, talked about today but uh, your input as uh, part of our network is uh, very much appreciated 